Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good afternoon, Team Krulak community. My name is Major Ian Brown. I'm the Operations Officer at the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Creativity. And on behalf of the Marine Corps University, Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Krulak Center, welcome back to the Brewcast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. We will also be recording this webcast for the benefit of those in our community of interest who cannot join us today. So we ask that you be mindful of keeping your microphones muted to avoid disrupting the presentation, as well as turning off your webcams to help us stream smoothly. At the conclusion of the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. So if you have a question, just type it into the group chat and we will get to as many as we can after Mr. James concludes his presentation. With that, I'm pleased to turn things over to Dr. Brandon Valeriano, the Crelex Center's Brent Chair for Military Innovation, who will introduce today's speaker. Dr. Valeriano, over to you. Great, thank you, and I'm delighted to be here. And uh, it seems like we're kind of creating a makeshift great power politics week. Uh, we had a talk earlier today with the Krulak chairs, and we're going to follow that on with a talk today from Patrick James. Uh, Pat James is a Dornscheif uh, Dean's Professor of International Relations at the University of Southern California. He is the author and editor of over 30 books and over 160 articles serving as a key foundation point for international relations and the study of structural politics and also the study of Canadian foreign policy, but let's not hold that against him. He also serves as the non-resident fellow at the Krulak Center. And uh, more importantly, I'm proud to call Pat my friend. I've known Pat for about 20 years now. I think the first time I talked to him, I overslept as a 23-year-old grad student when we're supposed to go to a battlefield. I think it was the Battle of Franklin or the Battle of Nashville. I forget which one. And it's funny how things have changed because now uh, staff rides are a common part of my life. And so is Pat James. So with that, I'll turn it over to him. Brandon, thank you uh, very much for those memories. And it is indeed great to be here with you today, to be your friend and to be making new ones. Uh, I'm delighted to have a chance to speak today about a collaborative project, and I think Ian is about to put those slides up for me, and we'll get things underway. Terrific. Ian, thank you very much. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a book with my collaborators, you can see listed. This will appear with Bristol University Press at some point early on. I suspect in uh, in 2021, given our rate of progress, we're very far along. I'm going to give you a sense of what we've discovered in the book and moving forward to the outline. I'm going to try to accomplish the following six things over the course of the next 30 to 35 or so minutes. I'm going to tell you about the purpose of the project, present some arguments that are contained within the book, then on to two sources of data. First, some interviews and then surveys. I'll talk about the implications of what we found in our project for great power competition and looking at cross-strait relations, China, Taiwan, and the role of the U.S. and East Asia, and then I'll sum things up. So in moving forward, we're studying great power competition in an era of rapid change, trying to learn as much as we can about it. A basic argument is that to do so under these difficult conditions, unpredictable, who knows what's coming next, and it all happens so fast, we need a regional focus, so we need to combine these things together. Looking at great power competition within a regional context arguably is how we will learn the most about where the international system is going. We're trying substantively to understand the connections between and among the dramatic rise of China, the identities, note the plural in Taiwan, stay tuned as to why we're going to focus on such things and why we think they're so important. Cross-strait relations, in other words, the mainland in Taiwan, and notice in friends and insecurities, that will turn out to be very important along the way. And then the bottom line vis-a-vis -vis great power competition, the role of the United States in East Asia. So think of these questions that we're trying to answer along the way. How has China's rise altered the following things? The way in which the people of Taiwan think about themselves, their identities, if you will, the relationship in the Taiwan Strait itself between the mainland 
and Taiwan. And then the U.S. role in all of this and how it reverberates outward into great power competition. On then to the arguments, having said a little bit about the purpose. Here's a book that everybody reads at some point or another. Oh, Brandon wanted some humor. Wow, wouldn't you like to have this guy's citation count? So Thucydides, The History of the Peloponnesian War, is one of the greatest books in the history of international relations, utterly foundational. One of the quotations of it that's especially memorable and relevant in our context is that in this story of war long ago, Athens and Sparta are the leading city-states. And the quotation I'm thinking of in particular, and there are many, many great ones in this book, is that the rise of Athens and the fear it instilled in Sparta made war inevitable. It seemed to, at least, in that ancient context. Is war inevitable now between modern incarnations of Athens and Sparta? Stay tuned. In a 20th or even 21st century context, translation of Thucydides and his brilliant history of the Peloponnesian War into social scientific terms takes place through power transition theory. Uh, the late and great Ken Organsky in 1958 in a book, very intricate and complex book, simply called World Politics, got into the idea of the power transition briefly Instead of a, a Kissinger style focus on the game of musical chairs among great powers, think shifting alliances, the concert of Europe as the archetype, if you will, from the 19th century. Instead, Organsky says, let's look at the apex of the system, who is the leading state and who is either a realized or potential challenger. Doug Lemke, an intellectual descendant of Organsky and a, and a fabulous one, a, a great scholar, in a book called Regions of War and Peace, urges us to look at regional hierarchies. In other words, explosions in the global system could have foundations in regions and even sub-regions. So we, of course, in this context, are looking at East Asia, in particular, Taiwan and China. Importantly, the power transition elements are about the United States and China within this regional context, as in what's going on between the two of them. We're going to try to get at where that story is headed through our research. So here in the eyes of myself and my collaborators, and indeed many people who are quarreling and arguing about this, this is possibly the most dangerous real estate in the entire world, the Taiwan Strait. We're going to see why, because some of the identity-related factors are going to be important here, but this is one of the most explosive areas. So if one would ask in this talk, you're trying to understand great power competition. Why Taiwan? Why identity? Why this sort of thing? First of all, this is a very important subregion to understand. And see, if you can make it out, it's supposed to be a hall of mirrors. It might be hard to see on this particular slide. Notice the word perceptions is emphasized. The material rise of China is a story that's clear and easy to see. But reverberating, much like a hall of mirrors effect, our senses of, ID, of identity across the strait, perceptions and misperceptions that can really matter to great power competition. We're going to explore this and notice that I emphasized insecurities earlier on. Insecurities are going to factor into things as well. I could put up a whole bunch of different graphics. All that really matters is the shape of this. This is the takeoff of China uh, in terms of its GDP, going back to major reforms from 1978 into the second decade of the 21st century. There is the typical sort of S curve here. If we extended it, it's flattening, but importantly, the takeoff was reached. One thing no one will argue about, regardless of how they feel about the exact balance of capabilities between China and the United States, is that China clearly now, if anyone deserves the mantle of challenger, if the U.S. is the leader, it's China. So at the very least, China is challenging, and who knows, depending on the indicators, is it possibly even leading in some ways? But at the very least, it makes sense to focus on the U.S. and China and the subregion, the home base of China, of course, East Asia, in particular, the Taiwan Strait. What about what's going on inside of China, aside from its tremendous material rise? It's actually more about something that isn't going on. There's a lack of political reform. And while it is not Mao's China, it is not the United States uh, or a, a contemporary democracy in other form, it simply isn't. At the same time, within Taiwan, 
Over the course of the dramatic rise of China in material terms of the mainland, there has been, if you will, a rise of democracy, an equally dramatic set of changes within Taiwan and a, an attendant Taiwanese identity that's been developing. And this is going to turn out to be very important as we move forward. Moreover, the democratic life of Taiwan, as this experience moves forward, causes the identity to evolve further. And the argument then is that the static situation on the mainland, politically speaking, still very autocratic, uh, relatively low uh, performance on human rights, is becoming more and more of a contrast with what's going on in Taiwan, in particular, how the Taiwanese identity is evolving away from one it once had been. What about the U.S. and all of this? Later on, after we go through the research, we're going to find out that the way in which the United States perceives Taiwan can have enormous implications for what it does when the going gets tough in the cross-strait relations. This is a wonderful book called Defending Frenemies by Jeff Talfaro. In its chapters, and one of them, by the way, is on Taiwan, he's looking specifically about non-proliferation with so-called frenemies. If you haven't heard the term before, it means a friend, but at times a nettlesome or troublesome one. So a state such as Taiwan qualifies. Taiwan could do things that cause a lot of trouble for the United States, and occasionally it has in the past. So the book is about defending these frenemies. What are the circumstances under which one might come to their aid. How does all of that relate to nuclear proliferation and non-proliferation? That's not our agenda for today, but perceptions about Taiwan as a potentially troublesome U.S. friend are out there, and there's a pretty strong consensus about it. Now on to our data. We have two kinds. First, our interviews. We did about 40 elite interviews that spanned the public sector, current and former elected officials, military officers, quite high ranking. These were mostly one-on-one, -on -one, occasionally groups, depending upon the circumstances. And we used a snowball or chain referral. In other words, names gave us more names. Chen Hao Huang and I, who conducted these multiple waves of interviews, are reasonably well connected with the university uh, seen there as well. So we had a lot of help from academics and their friends. So we, we feel that we had a pretty representative sample. The approach was semi-structured and we would send questions ahead of time. In the elite interviewing context, one does not dictate, obviously, and demand a particular agenda of discussion because the parties concerned see themselves as quite expert, and they are, because we, we like to think we made good choices here. These interviews sometimes wandered off the direct agenda, but importantly, were always very insightful and valuable because of the very people we were talking to. So there was a set of 20 questions. We gave these questions ahead of time, as noted to the interviewees. There was a pretty good balance between blue and green, but given the overall partisanship direction on the island, it tilted a little green, but not excessively. For those not familiar with the color spectrum on the island, Blue refers to a coalition loosely formed around the Kuomintang, or KMT. This refers to the Nationalist Party that fled the mainland uh, once and for all in 1949 when it was defeated under the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek in the Chinese Civil War. So this, are, this is essentially a mass migration to Taiwan, and the KMT was the dominant party, in fact, the only legal one, for a very long time when Taiwan was not really a democracy. The DPP, or Democratic Progressive Party, think green here was the alternative, initially, in fact, illegal, but now actually the stronger of the two parties in terms of overall allegiance. Pan blue and pan green are differentiated in the following way. Curiously, they're hybrids of our Democrats and Republicans. Blue is more pro-business, but interestingly enough, more oriented toward detente with the mainland because of the origins that it has, that would make some sense, right? There's a desire uh, for reunification, if somehow possible. Whereas green would be more economic populist, more concerned with the working class, if you will. And at the same time, though, more oriented toward security and staying aloof from the mainland, even at one point strongly oriented toward independence and possibly even declaring independence from China. So we had a balance. Uh, we had people all over the place on that spectrum, a little bit more green than blue, but pretty representative. What did we ask them about? 
We asked them specifics about policy issues, such as the very prominent and still controversial initiative from the last pan blue president, Ma, which is called the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement. We also asked about the Sunflower Movement, which was largely student-led and very anti-mainland. We furthermore asked kind of general philosophical questions about Taiwanese identity and the rise of China. As one should in an interview setting, we did not prompt or use academic terminology ourselves. Only if someone introduced this type of academic, theoretically oriented language did we engage with them. The soundbite before we talk about the results in either context is that our findings from the interviews closely parallel those of the surveys. What do we find out of these many hours of interviews? Three factors are driving a growing sense of distinctiveness on the island. First, and secular in nature, of course, are demographic shifts in Taiwan. Fewer and fewer people are alive now who came over in 1949 or even directly descended from those. So the sense of a symbolic attachment of returning to the motherland is weakening. In other words, the basic foundation of the Pan Blue is weakening over time. And there, uh, somebody could mute, please. There, there is a, a, a diminution of their natural base and they're struggling to try to reinvent themselves. So, there's less of a, an attachment to the mainland in terms of identity. Moreover, and, and in intensifying that trend, is that Beijing has been narrow in its interpretation of what is meant by one China. We can get into that in the Q&A. They have been paralyzing Taiwan's international space in that countries are discouraged from having diplomatic contacts with Taiwan. There are enormous sensitivities on the mainland about an independent Taiwan in particular. Third and finally, the electorate, and this comes out from the interviews with the elites, and it's confirmed through our surveys, our mass surveys, if you will. The electorate wants stability and predictability, a middle ground over detente, which is what the deep blue would want, reconciliation with the mainland. Or, on the other hand, declaring independence, which is what deep green would want, the two ends of the political spectrum if you will, are softening and people are moving toward the middle. Blue and green together, aquamarine. This arguably is the emerging identity within Taiwan. This is going to be the bottom line and it will be important later on for the playing out of great power politics. Okay, how about the surveys? Uh, we give our, our heartfelt thanks to the two institutions noted here that were very, very helpful. Uh, and we worked, of course, with local partners on the surveys, they were carried out very professionally and we feel very strongly confident about the results that I'm about to summarize. So many thanks to both of the institutions noted. I'm going to show you a few graphs and pie charts from the relevant points within the book. And here's a question that we asked. Do you think the standard of living will be better in Taiwan or mainland China in 10 years? There's a lot of ambivalence here, but there's actually a small plurality, which is kind of interesting in favor of mainland China, even as we see overall the modal answer is, is ambivalence. Who knows? Sensible, perhaps. But the rise of China has made something that was once unthinkable seem true, namely that the mainland will outperform China economically. This would not have been in play a number of decades ago. It is now. So think of this as a potential magnetic attraction on the one hand from the mainland to Taiwan is that if we want to be prosperous, maybe we need to connect with them more. Here is a chart. I apologize if the uh, scaling on it is difficult to read, but it, it'll be easy to understand and interpret. That looks somewhat like a normal curve, if you will. And the question is, is the economic rise of China a threat or opportunity? Notice that opinion is smack in the middle. It distributes right in the point of ambivalence or uncertainty, kind of reinforces the previous graphic is in, well, it has elements of both opportunity and threat. So what are we going to do about this? The threat part relates, not surprisingly, to attendant politics from too much integration with the mainland, in other words, loss of autonomy and a threat to the democratic identity. Another chart, do you think you should speak more native dialect or language? And look at the number here. This, again, would not have been true if the question had been asked some decades ago, at least not as strong. Anyway, almost two-thirds are saying, well, yes, we should. 
This is a strong indicator of the emerging sense of being Taiwanese, a greater openness to speaking languages uh, that had not been predominant and were certainly not connected to the migration of the KMT from the mainland. What matters with this question, do you wish the status of Taiwan and mainland China to be unification, independence, or status quo, is how many of the people answering want the status quo either in connection to something else or perhaps on its own, whatever indeed it even means, and we're up to very high numbers. Another important thing to take from this is that views are kind of all over the place. In other words, it doesn't seem like anything is a dominant position. The highest percentage you can get in response is status quo now, decide later, 38%. Once again, reinforcing the sense of moving to the center and or ambivalence, if you like, about what's going to happen and what should happen. What does the status quo mean? The important thing about this particular graphic, once again, is that you don't have some huge overwhelming number. You've got a lot of different interpretations of what is meant by the status quo. This is because in terms of safety for Taiwan as a security issue, it's best not to be too specific. In other words, does it mean de facto independence coupled with legal status as part of some kind of larger one China? There are all kinds of different nuances. If we given more categories for people to choose, we get an even wider range of answers. So status quo is an abeyance in a sense. Who knows exactly what it means? That's important too, in that it also moves in the direction of moderation, a dominant tendency toward either what was once a pan blue or pan green preference in any kind of intense way. This may be the most revealing slide of all in terms of identity. Do you consider yourself Taiwanese, Chinese, both or other? Look at the percentage of, say, Taiwanese together with both. That's 98% of the public. That's a major and staggering change in its own way, arguably, as dramatic and important as that exponential growth curve that I showed you for the mainland's economy. In other words, the degree of change in the mainland in material terms is equaled by changes in Taiwan in ideational terms. And it's all in the direction of being Taiwanese. Now we're getting closer to some things that are directly connected to the role of the United States in great power competition. This is a slide that goes on the horizontal axis from zero to 100. In other words, percentage or probability. If there's a clash in the cross-strait region, how likely is the United States to defend Taiwan? Opinion is barely majority, if you take 50% as the threshold, expecting help from the US. This is very important in terms of how we'll play out. Notice that there's a so-called shelling K point, in other words, a salient point of 50-50. The only number that commands a relatively large individual coding or of responses from people in the survey is 50%. In other words, flip a coin. More people are optimistic than pessimistic, but importantly, because of all the ambivalence and the rapid rise of China, there's a great deal of uncertainty in that Chinese, excuse me, Taiwanese, even though they have not read Jeff Talaparo's book and don't know what a frenemy is, there's a latent sense that the United States and, and, and Taiwan are not in the same relationship they once were. There's a great deal of uncertainty going forward. So summing up what we found with the two sets of data, if we had more time to report the survey and interview responses are remarkably reinforcing of each other. There is a soundbite here, a shift from an overwhelming sense of being Chinese to being a mixed Chinese-Taiwanese identity to an emerging consensus on being Taiwanese. It really seems to be moving in that direction if you look at the data in aggregate from both sources. Now, a kind of magnetic sense of things. Economic convergence is the attraction of the mainland. But there's also political divergence or repulsion, just like magnetic polarity. Think of those identity-related points that were made before about the mainland being static in terms of its autocracy and lack of respect for human rights, whereas Taiwan has changed so dramatically over the course of decades. So it is attracted to the mainland in objective material terms, the mainland is performing really well, it's prosperous, a lot to be gained from contact with it, from exchange. At the same time, we don't want too much, we don't want to be absorbed. 
Economic and social integration, in other words, with the mainland, could even be threatening to this emerging Taiwan's identity. And as per some statements made at the outset and the argumentation of this, that democratization leads to different socialization on the island. As, as cohorts are coming up, think of the educational system. It's a very different place in the way stories are told than it once was. The trend toward democratization is very powerful and stronger with time. All right, well, so what? What about great power competition? Well, President Tsai continues in power, and it is very likely her government will continue to work on consensus about identity, that Taiwan is a democracy with respect for human rights. Reforms are high on the government's agenda. Importantly, domestic, political, judicial, and structural economic reforms underway are not just about the island itself, and strengthening consensus, making the island more unified, if you will, more able to stand up to external pressures. There's also another audience for this. Drum roll for the next slide. It's the United States. The greater the degree to which Taiwan can project an image across the Pacific Ocean all the way into Washington as a consolidated democracy, on average, the higher the likelihood that the United States public opinion will be pro-Taiwanese. So we're not in the Cold War where as long as you were anti-Soviet, we were going to prop up your government. It's a lot more complicated now. And furthermore, after Iraq and Afghanistan, there's much more risk aversion in the public about involvements abroad. All of that combined, it is not only in size DPP party interest and ideology to move in a certain direction on the island itself. These changes actually may help to increase Taiwanese security because of the way in which Taiwan is perceived by its most important patron, the United States. So in terms of great power competition, as the sense of distinctiveness in Taiwan increases, as movement toward the center and away from detente and independence continues, in other words, public opinion continues to get less blue or green and more aquamarine, Something that sounds bad in a way will continue, but it's actually, from a great power standpoint, from a U.S. standpoint, actually a good thing, a political stalemate will continue in the Taiwan Strait. So let's now talk about U.S. interests and some historical references, the first of which is the bad one. The Crimean War was a long time ago, but sometimes the old wine comes back up in, in new bottles, if you will. Just think of what's going on now. And while neither the Russian Empire nor the Ottoman Empire exists anymore, as they did in the 1850s when they were squaring off in this conflict. Uh, they, the players just have different names now, arguably. Importantly, from a great power or system leader standpoint, this war is very destructive. In many ways, it's, it's, it's sheer butchery and, and geostrategically, uh, from the standpoint of Britain, which was at the height of its powers at the time, quite unnecessary and really quite disturbing. In other words, the British did not welcome this, did not want involvement in it, and, and neither did their, their partners, the French. But importantly, situations in sub-regions can get out of control for any number of reasons. Here it's largely the, uh, the decline and insecurity of the Ottoman Empire, uh, which is at a much more advanced stage than the Russian one. But arguably, things are getting wobbly in this part of the world. The system manager at the time, Britain, uh, is, is in the dominant position. This is not desirable. That's the unhappy scenario. What if things heat up in the Taiwan Strait? Not good from a U.S. point of view. This is a much happier story. Uh, in 1903, the remaining territorial claims, except for a few things offshore that are, that are minor, arguably, between Canada and the United States with respect to the Alaskan boundary, it's resolved. Britain at this time is largely in control of Canadian foreign policy. So Canada and Britain negotiate a middle ground position with the United States. Wasn't very popular in Canada, but a century later on, it looks like two friends trying to get along. I'm talking about the great power in decline, Britain, relatively speaking, and the one on the rise globally, the United States. Britain is desperate to negotiate this in a peaceful way and make some concessions to the United States as a result of this. There is no war in this locality. It doesn't happen. Arguably, Britain adjusted extremely well 
and quite successfully in the end to the rise of the United States, which looked really rapid by 19th century standards. The rise of China arguably is even faster. And these kinds of challenges as to what will go on in regions and subregions, they're arguably the greatest threat to peace then and now. So the United States would prefer to find itself perhaps as it as it loses ground to China in something close to a peer status in East Asia. We can talk about that more during Q&A. The idea that the mainland is going to go away and just put up with whatever the United States does, that's passe. That's not going to happen at all. Oh, I bet you did not think that I was going to put up a graphic from the 1990s movie Speed, starring Ken Reeves and Sandra Bullock. If you haven't seen it, it's about a bus that has to be driven at precisely and exactly, I think it's 50 miles an hour, or an explosive device will go off. So I think of this sometimes in trying to sum up what is going on in the Taiwan Strait. The United States, in driving this particular bus, wants to see this aquamarine identity reinforced on the island, as in don't get too close to China, don't get absorbed by them. That's a net loss for the U.S. as a patron. At the same time, it's not realistic for Taiwan to declare independence. That is going to provoke a war and would be more of a enemy type of behavior from this time by the U.S. Is it as tough in the movie with no, as it is in the movie with no room for error, exactly 50 miles an hour? The comparison doesn't work perfectly. There is some margin for error, but the United States must be careful about how it manages relations with this key client state as in try to stay down the middle, let's go off the rain. Summing up, I'll just finish with questions and provocations, if you will. So will the U.S. and the People's Republic of China manage a power transition in East Asia where China, at least in its own backyard, I mean the mainland, is at least a peer with the U.S.? It cannot be treated as an inferior because of huge changes in material capabilities. Following on from that, is China a status quo or revisionist power? Read all the major journals, and the quarreling about that continues with no resolution. And we come full circle back to identity. Taiwan, sounds like an odd thing to say, but I hope it makes sense after this discussion I've put forward. What is Taiwan's Taiwanese role in all of this, in the power transition between China and the U.S., now no longer dominant, arguably, in East Asia. What does it mean to have a Taiwanese Taiwan as opposed to arguably what it had back in the heyday of the KMT as the dominant party, where it's now arguably this more complex aquamarine entity? How can all of this be managed? Well, thank you for listening, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Great. Thank you, Dr. James. Uh, I'll ask a few questions, and then... Uh... If anyone else wants to ask a question or contribute, they can ask in the chat or raise their hands, and I'll call on you. But as many of you know, we like to have people ask your question um, uh, through your own voice. So that would be nice if you can. Um, let me ask you, Dr. James, as a scholar of great power competition for, what, 40 years now? I don't know. How long have you been doing this stuff? Um, but what did you think about the latest moves in the DOD and uh, the national defense um, strategy to reassert a return to great power politics? My basic reaction, and I mean this in an entirely respectful way, is that I don't think great power competition ever went away. I think it's a matter of how things are perceived. So in terms of the sort of long arc of academic thinking, I believe there was an overreaction to what happened with the decline and fall of the Soviet Union. I'll just cite one essay, and again, I do not mean this to be disrespectful, but uh, Francis Fukuyama on the end of history, probably just about everybody listening in is familiar with that. It was a sense of triumphalism, that there was no great power competition anymore, that it would never come back. And at the same time, if you think of the academic world, the counterpoint to this was largely from realists who were temporarily at least ridiculed as in why would you want to focus on power politics anymore, especially the great powers, the United States and its coalition, the Washington consensus are completely dominant once and for all and forever. I think in terms of a, a national defense strategy uh, and, and the shorter term arc of what has been done well or poorly is I was not pleased, for example, when the Obama administration announced a pivot to Asia. I don't think we should necessarily, in talking about the U.S. interest at this point, 
be announcing what we might pay attention to and what we might ignore. I, I'm not sure where the advantages were in that. As for more recent thinking, I think it's terrific uh, as someone who has been privileged to receive support from the DOD through its Minerva grant program. I think it's absolutely terrific that there is an interest in power projection. And I don't think that interest should ever have gone away. I'd be pleased, Dr. Valeriano, to elaborate on what I mean by that. But my view is to, that to understand escalation, we need to look in a regional context and we need to look at multiple stages, so-called near crises through crises that are more familiar, like the Cuban missiles of 1962, all the way through to full-scale war, like war in Iraq. I don't think geopolitics and realist concerns ever, ever truly went away. I think there was some wishful thinking for some time that they would, but they continue to rage on. So many follow-ups from that. But, um, you know, let me dive in on one aspect of that is, you know, you mentioned regionalism. Uh, you know, your, your scholarship here is really focused on Taiwan, third-party actors. You've been doing structural politics for a long time. Is that where you think the field needs to go? Is that where you think the main lessons are? How, you, how have you evolved as a scholar of structural politics over your career? The, I'll take the autobiographical part and, and run with it a little bit because I think it, it gets us up to 2020. I think that our field, uh, writ large, international relations, is just like fashion, you know, for those of us who are more in my age group, and yes, I have been around a long time, people may remember bell-bottom trousers. They remember tie-dyed shirts or whatever the case may be. Why am I even mentioning this? I don't mean this to, to make fun of any particular line of research, but at times there are certain waves or fads, whatever you want to call them. So I'm going to cite two. There was a lot of first-rate work done, but there was a lot of fad following on first the democratic peace, the idea that there was going to be this sort of Kantian world. And I crossed my arms at that one and stroked my non-beard or whatever and said, I I'm not buying this. I think this is too too triumphalist. And then after 9-11, uh, again, I don't mean to disrespect first-rate works of scholarship that were done. Everybody had to have their terrorism paper. So now the only thing that matters are non-state actors. I think all of this was an overreaction. I think structural politics always mattered. And my view is that when the Soviet Union imploded and shattered, that it was only a matter of time, as the saying goes, for new challengers to rise. This was absolutely going to happen. And econometricians who were looking at growth rates and, and movement around the world would have picked China, uh, honorable mention to India some decades later, these are the states that are on the rise. Uh, Russia is a kleptocracy with a small uh, and, and really quite parasitically damaged economy. It, it, is, it does not have a foundation for long-term power unless there is some kind of revolutionary change to get rid of the kleptocrats. I don't see that happening anytime soon. So as an advocate of looking at power structures all the way back to when I was a doctoral student in my early days, as an assistant professor, I was really interested in world level or global power structures, polarity, in other words, unipolarity, bipolarity, multipolarity, and also elaborating on those concepts and talking about more specific traits at a regional level. Here we are in 2020. My view is that we are in incipient bipolarity and that within 10 to 20 years, the insights that we have piled up over the years about multipolarity and debates about all of that, it's coming back. It, I think it, it's coming back into prominence, not because it wasn't relevant all along, but there was a tendency to be driven by major and shattering world events, uh, like the collapse of the Soviet Union, like the 9-11 attacks, to, to move away from classic concerns and theories toward things that arguably were overreactions. So likely a related question here. Um, I mean, you've certainly seen me evolve into a cyber scholar as a lot of your friends have kind of evolved into these gray zone kind of scholars. Um, how do you think operations in the gray zone, covert operations, deniable operations, cyber AI, how do you think that's going to affect polarity and great power politics moving forward? I think these will become instruments and zones within which great power competition continues. So, for example, if you look at the behavior 
of uh, the Chinese mainland government. I'll give you a citation of a terrific article about this, a path-breaking one to, that really zeroes in, I think, in answering your question. Uh, Gary King and his associates published something in the very prominent journal Science, one of the top journals in the entire world, about censorship on the part of the PRC. Interestingly enough, and we haven't talked about this element of insecurity yet, a great power is on the balancing, to borrow Stephen David's term, in new ways. What do I mean by that? With the rise of cyber and the Internet, you must be concerned about cybersecurity at home and abroad simultaneously. So what King and his associates find is something fascinating. Half of it's not going to surprise you. The other half might. Yes, anything that looks like collective action in opposition to the regime, think of something that might end up like Tiananmen Square from 1989, that is crushed very quickly. So you can chatter and say mean things about the party, but if you look like you're trying to organize in any way, they come after you. Importantly, equally censored are, strangely, what look like pro-government collective action because, collective actions, pardon me, because there are worries that nationalistic rage over issues such as Hong Kong and Taiwan can really anger the public and whip things up to the point where the party may risk losing control. In other words, the, the anger, the rage just gets too extreme. And this, there's a, a narrative of humiliation. Many people do not know, for instance, that there's a national day of humiliation in China, which sounds very strange. It's largely directed against the Japanese occupation of Manchuria, but more generally against imperialism. So China in the cyber world is, of course, engaging in its own uh, PLA-related offensive activities. And that would be an area, Brandon, of course, where you have much more expertise than I ever will. At the same time, the science article from King Associates shows the omnibalancing, trying to stay safe at home by preventing both, strangely, pro- and anti-government collective action from unfolding because of the risk of losing control. So there are new elements of great power competition. How do you play offense and defense in the 21st century? You need to be in cyber as well as the material world we can see. Okay, great. I, thank you. I, I never really thought about applying omnibalancing here, but I assume my our mutual friend John Basquez would not like that term. So <laughs> I, I'll have one more question, and let me know if anyone in the audience wants to ask a question or JD here. I don't know if that's a question or a comment, but we certainly welcome questions. Um, so your, your project that you presented today and a lot of your work that you're working on now is funded by the DOD and Minerva. What have you learned by interacting with the DOD and the goals of the Minerva program as it meets scholarship? And what advice do you have to other scholars as they move down that path? I strongly urge collaboration uh, with people in the military. And uh, it's been a really great privilege to work, for example, with Scott Silverstone at West Point. And he, he has added an enormous amount to my collaborations in studying power projection, great power politics, great gray zone conflict, as you labeled it before. And I think it can be a very revealing experience in terms of policy relevance that the concerns of foreign policy sometimes arguably get too much under the rubric of think tanks, so-called white papers, or whatever the case may be. Academics have something to offer too, and uh, you can see, Brandon, the graphic that, that's up there. Uh, one thing that in my collaboration with people in the military they found interesting is the idea of a translatable graphic language for conveying cause and effect and argumentation, importantly in ways that are not jargonized, that might help in, in, in cognition, if you will. And the approach that you see, there's an example here, uh, essentially, it's our book in one page, the book that I've been talking about today. And there's a particular set of notation that's used. I have developed, and there's great interest, at least so far, I hope people on this on this broadcast will be interested in contacting me, because I'd love to have your work represented in my archive. By representing more work graphically in this type of form that's translatable, we strengthen the ability of people in, if you will, the policy-oriented sector and academia to talk to each other. 
because right now it's a virtual tower of Babel. Uh, we're both active, for instance, in the International Studies Association, which has over 7,000 members. It's like sectors of that are talking in completely different tongues, where they have almost no contact with each other anymore. So to circle back, my view is that a graphic term, and I got into this in my presidential address for the International Studies Association, it was published in International Studies Quarterly in 2019, my view is if we're going to have more productive contact between people who are in the, the military slash policy world and academe, we must have a visually oriented translation mechanism. Uh, obviously, there's no time to explain the graphic you see in detail, but if I did have some time to talk about it, it's a relatively simple to learn uh, program where you can take literally any book or article, regardless of its subject, and put it onto one page for discussion. Oh, great. It seems like you and um, uh, my good friend uh, Ben Jensen have kind of come to the same conclusion. He's been doing uh, these causal models in class for a long time, and I wonder if it's because of the same kind of uh, outgrowth of uh, engagement that you're kind of experiencing now. Um, yeah, I, I, if there's any other questions, you know, let me know. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat or anything. Um, I guess we'll just wrap up by uh, asking uh, Dr. James what you're working on next after this and where you're going uh, with the rest of your research. Thanks so much. Uh, I've been, as you pointed out, I've been at this for a while, and I am uh, an unashamed realist. And what I have done, and we are, of course, uh, both very close to Professor John Vasquez, who, in my opinion, is the world's uh, most brilliant and successful critic of realism. We have lots of engagements with each other. I'm writing a book that looks at the totality of realism on the study of the causes of interstate war since World War II. So it's a very long manuscript. Um, it applies that technique. It literally takes all of the books that have been written from a realist standpoint about the causes of war in the last 75 years, translates them into this graphic format that I have developed and uses this to try to get a greater sense of wisdom, uh, applied knowledge about why wars occur and how we might prevent them. Uh, this is the, the work that I'm spending the most time on now that's a solo type of project. But I also have uh, my collaboration with people in Minerva uh, who are interested in great power projection you know, beyond the scope, scope of our discussion today to say much more than I did a few minutes ago. This is about gray zone con conflict, great power competition. And to circle back, as a realist, I think none of this ever went away. I think at times there were, it was wishful thinking that realpolitik, that great power politics and competition went away. They never did. They perhaps were dormant for a while in some locations, but they have this way of coming back. Okay, great. Well, thank you, and uh, we appreciate your contributions this week to the Marine Corps University. Uh, normally, we'd give you a coin right now, but we're in the COVID land, so we cannot add to your coin collection. So I'll <laughs> hand off to uh, Major Brown. All right. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Valeriano and uh, Mr. James. Uh, thank you again. Uh, we got uh, a double header with you the last couple of days, so we're grateful for your help with our faculty development program as well as reaching out to our broadcast audience. So uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Um, to everyone else in the audience, thank you for joining us for this week's broadcast. Make sure you come back next week where we'll be leaving the real world for the world of fiction. Team Krulak non-resident fellow and best-selling author August Cole will join us for a look at Ficken or useful fiction as a tool for exploring real-world problems. We'll see you all then. Thank you. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.